Hey, welcome to the Ask a Pastor podcast, where we're going to spend some time uh, diving deep on a question that you have sent in. My name is Joel. I'm a, a Strip District Campus Pastor, joined by Kurt Bjorklund, our Senior Pastor, and Joanne Adams, our Co-Director of Women's Ministry and Life Stage. It's a big title. Ah, come on. It's a, it's a, that is a big title. <laughs> Life Joanne stage Adams, one. Staffer. <laughs> uh, So let's, uh, so we're coming up on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So the goal here is to spend some time talking about race and especially, uh, what that looks like within the church, what the church can do about that. Um, but before we get into that specifically, the question that we want to start with is looking back on 2019, the best book that you've read is a highlight book for you. Kurt, you have to go first. I'll go first. Um, (laughs) I did not know you were going to ask this question, but the book that jumps to the top of my mind was a book called Seculosity, and uh, it deals with how we um, make almost religious-like affections out of all of our secular pursuits, Hmm. and I thought it was uh, really helpful to see my own tendency in some of those uh, categories and ways. Interesting. Explain that better. What is that? What do you mean by that? Uh, by seculosity? Yeah. Well, it's Explain the, concept more. The, the concept is basically the idea that that like your family, your work, your finances, your kids, your exercise, that all of those things we end up putting religious like devotion and affection into hmm. and we use them to replace devotion to God. That is our ultimate um, thing. And so it, it was just well done how. Uh, I think it was David Zoll, I think, wrote that. and uh, But, yeah, that, that was probably the best book I read. Wow. Joanne? So I'm always starting books. So I probably <laughs> started about three or four. <laughs> but the one that I read all the way through was Servant Leadership, and that was in preparation for a class we did here with young adults. And I, although I think I practiced Servant Leadership, I never read the book. And so that really just helped me to – not only prepare for the class, but also to see how I could better improve in some of the uh, things that I was doing as a leader. Hmm. Interesting. Joel, how about you? What was your best book? Um, I've been reading a lot of fiction the past two years. Um, so if I were to pick one of those, uh, I did Hop read on Hop on Pop Josh, podcast, Josh says. Um, I would say... Actually, I, I, I'm still midway through The Shining right now, and it's really interesting to wow. me. Um, I just love getting into a book that is uh, like immersive and imaginative. Um, okay, I probably shouldn't say this. So I've read the first uh, three and a half Game of Thrones books. Um, I've watched the first episode uh, on HBO, and I was like, there's no way I can watch this. Um, but I'll tell you what has been really interesting about those books is it's made me appreciate our uh, the life that we have today, because the value of life in those books is Mm. so low. Um, and it actually, I feel like has given me this different picture of some of what we read in the old Testament, just about Kings and the authority that they have. Um, so that's been really interesting, but midway through book four, I was like, I can't, I've quit that book twice now. So I think (laughs) I'm, I think I'm done for good. Okay. Not an endorsement for those books. Um, (laughs) <laughs> or, or the show. Def- I definitely couldn't hang. Like there was too much uh, content that was disruptive. I was show. Uh, I was with some some guys the other night, and one of the guys told me that his wife is into something. I what was it called K soaps or K pops or something? They're Korean, oh, Korean soap operas. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he said right. there's a whole group of women who that's their uh, indulgence. And I don't know why women. I guess he was just talking to guys. Maybe there's guys who are into it too. But um, yeah, evidently amazing. that that's like a new thing. So uh, so if wow. you, you don't want books, maybe that's a route yeah. to go. Hmm. Immersive experience. <laughs> um, hey, just uh, since we're coming up on Martin Luther King, I'm wearing Kids Fest swag. That's intentional. Kids Fest. Uh, registration is now open for Orchard Hill. So if you're local to Pittsburgh, Kids Fest is an awesome thing that happens every summer uh, around our Wexford campus, Butler campus, Strip District is is building one as well, uh, hopefully this summer. And so uh, get your kids involved. You won't regret it. Uh, you can go to orchardhill.com to do that. So let's jump into the topic by starting with this question. I'm talking about race, um, racial tensions within the church, Is this subject too political? Is this something that the church should just not talk about? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a step more. <laughs> more. Give us more, Kurt. Uh, no. <laughs> well, it, it, nothing should be too political. Anything that matters huh. should be something that the church is willing to address and talk about fully. Obviously, there are issues. I think what the church, at least Orchard Hill, I shouldn't say the church, a lot of churches lean into politics hard and just say, we're on this side, we're on that side, you're out, you know, that. What we don't want to do at Orchard Hill is we don't want to handle politics in sound bites. Hmm. And what I mean by that is we don't want to just say, well, if you're a Christian, you should believe this. We want to embrace a subject fully enough that if we talk about it, people can say, okay, I've, I've had a chance to kind of think about it from a biblical perspective and respond to it. But if we aren't talking about the issues of the day, um, then in some ways we're not um, being faithful to to address mm. the text that does address issues that are still contemporary to our day. Mm. That's good. What were you going to say, Joanne? I was going to say that, no, it's not too political. And uh, I agree with Kurt that it really depends on the church in terms of how you address it. As an example, I know I grew up in the black church, and uh, subjects of racism, social justice were um, regularly talked about. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, they were talked about in congregations that were solely black congregations. So there wasn't an opportunity to really have this dialogue about the tension. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason I wanted to start there is there's a, a pastor that I listen to, and he, and he says that So every, every year they do, uh, uh, beginning of the year, they do a message on abortion. They do a message on race. They do... Uh, I don't know what the other ones are, um, but he says he comes out of that abortion message and he gets all these emails from people. And this is, you know, Texas conservative, right? Um, you know, applauding him saying, good job handling that subject. And then he comes out of the race one and he gets all these emails from people that say, you know, way too political there. Shouldn't have done that. And, uh, and now that makes a lot of sense in a very conservative area. And I, you know, a, a church in a, in a much more progressive area would maybe have the opposite the opposite thing, talk about race all the time, but if you talk about abortion, now you're being too political. Um, and so I think there's sort of that gut check that we all need to have that just because someone uh, is on a different side of the political uh, spectrum than you are, um, if you're in church, you know, saying it's too political is is not a, a good way to uh, uh, a cop out, if that's a, the right way to say that. Well, yeah, the, um, the message I did right before Christmas Eve, so the 22nd of December, uh, I talked about this some, but it's it's interesting that if you really read through the Bible closely, there are times that you will come out feeling and sounding very liberal, and times you will come out sounding very conservative. Yeah, And you almost need to put aside uh, your political lenses in order to dive into the Bible in reality. And what I mean by that is if you go in expecting to have a confirmation of, of one side's political views, you'll be disappointed hmm. um, or challenged in some way. And what I mean is, is I think on issues of justice, uh, poverty, um, uh, community, some of those things, uh, the Bible sounds pretty liberal. Uh, when it comes to some other issues, sexuality, uh, family, maybe even gender at times, the, the Bible might sound very conservative to people. And so there's, mm -hmm. the, there's a built-in tension there, and, and I think that's why sometimes people say, let's just avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, any of those issues that touch the, the quote-unquote third rail. Um, and, and I know, like, like you know, certainly uh, you know, somebody who does a fair amount of teaching publicly— there are issues that, that if you just mention them, you know that you'll get negative reaction no matter how you come down on it. Yeah. Uh, we did a series a couple of years ago now on on gender, race, um, and uh, a abortion, few other things, yeah. abortion, um, all of the stuff that was in there. And and I got lots of lots more email than I normally get <laughs> and more people saying I'm done at the church yeah. than I normally get because of what you said yeah. and and so you know if you wait in but again i think to to remain silent is to be uh is to miss part of of what it is to proclaim the whole counsel of yeah. the word of god yeah 
But, you know, here's the thing. I think that sometimes when there are topics that are taught from the um, uh, stage, if you will, there's a one shot you talk mm -hmm. about it, and then there's little follow-up about it. So people who have passion about it in doing something, and that's where sometimes I think that the church misses out. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we will talk about these things, and there are, of course, people in the congregation who are on multiple sides. So to make a decision like, okay, we're going to go and we're going to do this, you would be spreading yourself very thin around right. all of these issues. And and sometimes that's where I struggle because there are hot topics for me that I I think like ooh I think you know we should probably do more about this. We should this. do five six weeks exactly. On that. Yeah. But you know how how do you make a decision then to go further to do mm -hmm. more? Right. No, that's a great question. I think yeah, as again somebody who gets a chance to shape a lot of the teaching, there's always issues that are left um like i looked back the other day and it's been f six years since i've done a direct teaching on the issue of homosexuality mm -hmm. um well that's a long time mm -hmm. in a church cycle right. um now some of that i would defend by saying um and you know wherever you come down on homosexuality the issue is is the church should have a voice on that right. um regardless and that's an issue you could say well how do you just do one week mm -hmm. Uh, that mm -hmm. needs five, six, whereas other people would say, don't, don't spend five weeks on that. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. G give it to me. Let's move on. Um, what we try to do here, which, um, which sometimes makes it hard is we try to teach generally expositionally through books mm -hmm. and let the topics come as they're in the text. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the downside of that is uh, instead of every year saying, we know that we're doing a message on abortion. We know we're doing one on race. We know we're doing this. Yeah. Um, sometimes it might be several years before it, it comes in the text. Now, sometimes yeah. we'll do a topical series like we did a few years ago where we said, it's been too long since that's come up naturally through a text. Yeah. Uh, when I taught through Acts, like race came up uh, yeah. clearly in the book of Acts. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't avoid that there it is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are different times that it's all of a sudden you say, okay, here's here the text emerges with the issue. But that's... Um, other than systematizing it, like every year we do Right to Life and Martin Luther King, and that's why I think mm -hmm. people do it, because those two days that we recognize nationally mm -hmm. uh, come in January. And so it's an easy time if you want to say we're doing these every year. But, yeah. but we've chosen to be a little more expositional in our approach. Yeah. So we had a brief conversation yesterday, and uh, um, you know, we wanted to handle the topic of race. And uh, and it's it seems crazy, f you know, for three white guys to sit sit here and talk about, you know, here's here's our explanation of race. So so obviously we want you to be a part of this because you have uh, experience that we don't have. But can you share what you I said? am black? Just in case, <laughs> yeah, in case that's you're true. on the radio that's, listener. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you share what you shared yesterday just about uh, being the spokesperson? Oh, yeah. It's interesting because sometimes whenever there's a topic about race, uh, because I'm black, people think that I am the expert mm -hmm. on it. And yes, I am the expert on my blackness, but mm -hmm. I am not the expert on everybody's. <laughs> uh, and so sometimes it just feels like the token. Uh, you know, we're going to have a discussion about this with a black person. Yeah. And what I'm going to give you is my perspective and... Um, that's all I can do. So I don't want anyone to think that I am giving the answer for every black person in the world. Yeah. I, I'm giving it from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what Kurt... And, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And I think the other thing is there are also um, uh, other people that have a perspective about it, and it's always good because I know I love it when I have conversations with people that have a widely different view than I do about yeah. race. And so having those discussions where you have these discussions that are widely different are always helpful and people to, to make their own decisions about yeah. some things. Yeah. I think what Kurt and I would both agree on, judging by the size of the pile of books that he has sitting next to him uh, about race is that this is something that uh, is not right today. 
that we need to figure out how to address race, um, both in terms of as a society and as a church. Um, so we certainly welcome your, uh, your input in this because, man, I just, I, I get overwhelmed by feeling like, how do we even, how do we even begin? How do we even get started on this? So, um, I don't, you got some notes written down there. Where, where do you want to start the conversation? Here? <laughs> I wasn't prepared to start it. I was not really prepared to engage in it. So it's interesting because living life as a black person, you know, as I started to do some research, I was like, okay, then what are we going to talk about? And I know the one issue um, is just really around should there be repentance for the sins of the uh, ancestors? Yeah. And um, as I did a little research, you know, and I was looking through the Bible and trying to see if there are references where there were, um, you know, uh, praying for the sins of the ancestors. And I know one reference was in Nehemiah, where Nehemiah prayed for, um, you know, the ancestors' wrongs, all the wrongs of the ancestors and uh, of his own before building the wall. Mm. And I thought, I thought, okay. And then I read an article about a church in D.C. that had this whole uh, service of repentance Mm. because the church was founded, the founders were slave owners. So they decided they were going to have this service where they would just uh, pray for, um, you know, those wrongs. But then they set forth a plan of how they were going to do things differently. Mm-hmm. So I'd just be interested in hearing from you. What do you think about whether or not um, I should blame you for the wrongs of your um, your forefathers yeah. around slavery? I, oh, man, I, I read an article uh, about a church in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and they the pastor said that he had done a bunch of research into the church's past. It was an old church and saw that the, it had a you know this long line of just racism within the church. And the church gathered and decided, um, we're going to repent of that, um, even though it was you know a long time ago. And they went through this repentance process. They changed the name of the church and uh, and you know basically, uh, all the all the members that existed signed this thing that they put on the mm. wall that said, you know, we are no longer this, um, and we're repenting of it. And I thought that was a really cool. Uh, that's that's an incredible way to deal with that, especially in that setting where the church has a very clear connection to the past. Um, you know, a little not not as much clarity in a church like Orchard Hill. That's uh, right. I don't know. Yeah, founded 30. in 1989. Yeah. So right. 30 years, 31 years old. Right. And doesn't have any clear tie. Yeah. Yeah, it's different if you were in the South or in the North even in an era when things were founded and said, hey, we only want yeah. certain people here. Yeah, right. I, I can see that being a very different issue. Yeah. Although I would say that um, we also need to think about uh, Orchard Hill in the sense that there are people who come here that may not have felt welcome because they were. Because mm-hmm. in the 1980s, sure. even in this area, yeah. I mean, let's talk about where we are. If someone that would look differently that came into Orchard Hill, mm-hmm. they may not have been welcomed mm-hmm. in the same way they're welcomed now. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I don't think because it is not in the south or right. it was in the 80s um yeah it doesn't it, mean that you that it didn't happen correct yeah. right yeah right yeah what i think i'm alluding to is i think it's one thing if you're in an institution that clearly participated in mm-hmm. versus just we exist in the shadow of yeah and, and i don't think that that absolves you saying we exist in the shadow of right but what I'm saying is it's different. Like, like here might be a way to think about it. If, if uh, as a kid, um, I grew up really wealthy. Uh, I did not. Um, this is an example. <laughs> but um, if I grew up really wealthy and I found out when I got older that the reason I'm wealthy is that my parents had been really dishonest and had uh, stolen a ton of money from other people, um, you know, by, by poor means. For me to continue living in that wealth without some repentance or reparation feels um, disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Um, However, uh, if I live in a world as as a wealthy child where my parents benefited from other people doing that, 
um, I'm still living in the shadow of it. Mm -hmm. And there's still something that needs to be done, but it's different than saying, well, my mom and dad stole from you. I'm making a reparation. Um, There's a step removed. And I'm not saying that that there isn't something there still to understand, Mm -hmm. but, but it's different. If it's if I have a direct line versus yeah. versus um, one that's that, that's a step removed. Now I realize that that's probably not a take mm-hmm. that everybody has uh, right. today. But but to me, it, once you start saying you have to repent of things that 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 don't have a direct uh, that that you can't directly trace back. Um, you, you know, th- there's no end then to to everything that sure. needs to be repented of um, every wrong and the world, uh, right. you're going to be repenting of. Uh, now, race, uh, especially in America in the time we live, is different because of this, and that is, um, and again, I know that this is not agreed on by a lot of white people who will hear this, but what the essence of white privilege in many ways is the essence of benefiting from something that that you didn't have any um, say in, in creating. Hmm. And, and just by virtue of being white, there has been benefit given to, to a white person. And so there is something in that that is um, problematic because even if, if my immediate white ancestors did not steal or participate in, um, they participated in a system that, that gave an advantage to um, me as a white person. Um, now, there are some voices. Uh, Shelby Steele is one of them and some others who is not revered by many in the black community, even though he's a black educator um, and author. Uh, and the books I've read, I try to read on both sides of the issue mm-hmm. so that I don't just get one side. Uh, he would say that, that, that now it's exaggerated uh, because the the flip has actually switched to where if you're a person of minority status in our country, we're so aware of it that that you're given more opportunity. Hmm. I don't know that that's true. Um, that's just another take. Yeah. I I know that um, maybe a couple of years ago, you and m- myself and a couple others from staff went to a mini conference that. Um, that dealt with race and and I don't know what we were sort of getting into, but I was. I was disturbed at the way they retold the history of America um, through the lens of the white and black conflict. And, uh, and that was for me the first time where it hit me that I, I am a part, I am downstream from some, some things that are, that are very bad and I am benefiting from them. And, uh, and I, I've really wrestled with how do I how do I make sense of that? How do I how should I feel about America? How should I feel about America's past? Um, what so what's your take on? Um, I mean, it, Kurt was distinguishing between you know when you have that clear line versus I'm living in the shadow of. I think this conversation is about living in the shadow of. Um, so so what do we do? Um, do we repent of the sins of the generations past? I think that's an individual decision. I think what is most important is what are you doing now? Mm. Um, So if you know there are some things that you are doing now that are inappropriate, then you need to make amends for that. And I think part of that is, I mean, how do we live our lives? We live our lives mostly in our own little communities the people that are our friends are people that are like us and um, that we share some common history with. Uh, those are people that we enjoy being around because sometimes it is, um, it doesn't feel good when you're with someone that you don't share any history with. Mm-hmm. I know as a black person, sometimes when I go into um, situations where people are mostly white, I have to get myself together because it's like, okay, I'm going to go in here. And this has happened throughout, you know, mostly throughout my career and my adult life that I've been the only person or one, you know, one of one or two people. So it's like, you know, I, I, I have to be bilingual because sometimes I just like to be with people where we're just talking like however we're going to talk, but then I have to go and I have to be appropriate 
and that doesn't feel good. However, when I'm in those situations, sometimes I always glean something about another individual. I always think, mm, that person's not so bad. Uh, or they might think the same about me. So I think it's making an effort to put yourselves in a situation that might not be where you are really comfortable. Interesting. Yeah, I love what you said there, Joanne, about repent if you want to. That doesn't matter nearly as much to me, not as much as what are you doing today. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the repentance question uh, can be almost a grandstanding. Mm -hmm. Like, we're doing something. We all repented. Sure. Right. Rather than saying, what are the systemic <clears throat> issues that are still happening today? Right. And am I part of some of them? Right. And is there anything that I can do to change some right. of those systemic systems? And and it really, it, you know, I've lived largely in more white areas of my life. Uh, I lived in the city of Chicago for a number of years. Um, but even then, it was a more white neighborhood than black neighborhood. There were certainly uh, interracial um, parts of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would say, you know, as somebody who's white, I have not heard very often white people sitting around trashing people of other races intentionally saying, oh, let's let, let, like the like the caricatures of race ism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm are not something that I've seen. Now, maybe it's because I'm in the church and a pastor and people right. don't want to do stuff in front of the pastor. You, you know, I don't know. But, um, and, and same thing, like, like, like when I've been around people who are hiring, you know, people who own companies, um, the question I hear is not, well, how can I hire more white people and not hire ethnic diversity? The mm -hmm. question I hear is, how can I hire ethnic diversity? Mm -hmm. um, and and, and so, so so I don't think that, that um, I'm not saying that, that overt racism does not exist. But but I think the bigger challenge is is the systems yeah. and the things that are are just built into our culture that you may not even see. Um, I, I noticed something the other day. I was just I was watching some TV and an ad came on for one of the exclusive resorts in the Caribbean, and and you know just just on the on the screen they had a bunch of white families sitting there enjoying themselves and out came the the black person who presumably was caribbean who right. served them right. and and like like you watch that and and at first it it didn't catch my attention and then all of a sudden i thought that is an example of portraying white as rich mm -hmm. and being served by black mm -hmm. and if you come here you're going to be served you're going to and and now did they intend all that i don't know i'm not going to presume their motives maybe they just said hey we just right. you know here we are but but that sends a message yeah. um Absolutely. in our culture and that is part of the systemic system that mm -hmm. that at some point an awareness and a ability to see it and say say i don't want to contribute to that if i can help in some way. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the resort necessarily, but maybe if that's what they're promoting, um, that might be a way to, yeah. to to avoid that is to say, OK, how, how does yeah. that live differently? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you said so many things there that I wanted to respond to. And one is that you've been in situations where you certainly don't have, you know, white people who are bashing people of color. Well, it's interesting. I won't say that I've been in situations where black people don't bash white people, but there are certainly situations where that I've been in where it's like, especially uh, being in a company and black people getting mm -hmm. together and talking about the racism that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. And it's been a hot topic for us. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the things that we can do about that? So I do think that in um, other environments, that certainly goes on. It, it is interesting to, uh, this is a story about my dad that just uh, I just keep thinking about. I lived in, a, I'm, as I've moved around, I've mostly lived in white neighborhoods in the suburbs. My dad did not grow up in a white neighborhood, always lived in black community. So he came to visit me in Chicago, and I was doing something, and the doorbell rang. And my dad answered the door, and he came back to me, and he said, there's a white man at the door, there's a white man at the door. I was like, yes. And it just was interesting how he was processing that, because to him it was like, uh-oh, something's wrong. What have you done? What is going on? And I said to my dad, I said, everybody in this neighborhood's white. I, 
mean? So I don't get it. Mm. And so it's like having that conversation with him. And so he stood with me. He was like, okay, I got to protect her in case something is happening here. And it was only the guy that was coming to talk about my garage doors. He passed by my house. He saw my <laughs> garage doors. He really liked them, and he wanted to talk about them. So oh, it, wow. it, it, huh. all of his references were around white people bad. You know, I nothing good comes out of this if they come to your house, especially. Um, and I just remember um, as a child growing up, we didn't necessarily talk about race. We didn't have those conversations. I just remember growing up as a child, um, seeing the riots, um, seeing Martin Luther King, and um, I, I remember distinctly the um, the um, garbage. Um, um, there was some, um, oh gosh, I can't remember now, in Alabama when he was there, and the garbage strike. And at the same time, there was a garbage strike going on in Oklahoma City, and I remember our church had this uh, rally and I wanted to go, and I was young, and my parents were like, no, you don't need to go because something might happen. I was like, no, I'm going, I'm going. So I remember having a real affinity for just knowing what was going on and being hurt by everything that I saw, although there were never any real conversations. Mm -hmm. there, there were only conversations when my dad was like in his 70s. He started to talk about some of the racism that he – um, experienced on his job. How much, do, Joanne, do you think things have changed in the last generation? Because even when you talk about um, some of those events, I'm too young to remember them. Um, and Joel is so, younger than me. Right. And also um, true. And, uh, <laughs> you know, probably yeah. doesn't remember some of those things. So, right. so, so you've lived long enough to have, to have seen, is it different? Is it Better is it not? Um, and um, how, how do you see that? I do think it's different and better, but it's only different and better because of some of those things that mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. then. I mean, I, I know that I would never have been able to work in corporate America at the level that I worked mm -hmm. in had some of those sacrifices not been made. I, mm -hmm. I recognize that fully. Um, so, yes, things are better, but, yeah, there's still, I mean, I still hear stories of um, race, and I still mm -hmm. experience some of that myself. I mean, so it's still happening. Um, it's interesting. There's this quote from Martin Luther King uh, that I loved, and, and he said, we will need to repent in this generation not only for hateful words and actions of bad people, but for appalling silence of good people. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's that some white people and others believe that some of this is wrong, some of the things that are going on, but they're silent. And silence is not only not speaking out, but doing the small things that you can do in your world. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, I think about my, my family. I mean, we didn't have those dis a lot of discussions about race. And I'm wondering, had we, what would it have meant for me? Yeah. Because the only time I came into contact with white people when I was growing up is when there was um, mandated busing. Mm -hmm. So I went to a white, you know, I had to go mm -hmm. to a white school. Yeah. And that's when I started to, you know, become familiar and get, um, began to form some friendships. But those friendships were only in school because nobody was coming in my neighborhood. And my mother certainly wasn't going to let me go into another neighborhood. So it, it wasn't like real, you know, relationships. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me ask this question. I um, am, I, I've always been sort of pro-America, right? Um, I think of the 4th of July as a holiday that as a Christian, I can, I can celebrate that uh, almost in a spiritual sense because I believe that God has used America to, to change the world. And, mm -hmm. um, just, just writing into our constitution, some of these 
biblical idea is that people are made in the image of God and um, and are and are equal, and like like that that has changed the world in yeah. huge ways over the past three hundred right. years. Except but, that Joel, yeah, go ahead. When that language is written, it wasn't written for me. Right. That language was written for you. Yeah. And I'm also pro America, but my narrative is very different yeah. than your narrative. And that's exactly my question is, is it right and appropriate for me to be pro-America? Should I be proud of what our country has done? Does the black community feel that way? Remember, I'm only speaking for me. Oh, sure. Does, <laughs> does Joanne but, feel that yeah. way? <laughs> um, I am proud to be an American. I've traveled to a, you know, a number of countries, and this is the best place that I know of. Hmm. However, we cannot create a story or a narrative that dismisses some of the things that have happened around uh, racism um, and around slavery. You can't dismiss that. Yeah. It, it did happen, and there are things that are going on now that are happening to people of color. Yeah. Um, so recognizing that we still have a long way to go. And some of these people are not ignorant people that are doing this. Some of these people are very educated and are using the Bible mm -hmm. to carry out some of this, uh, what I would call like backward thinking. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, can you give an example of that in today's world, J just so that somebody could say, okay, I'm connecting the dot to where that's still happening? Because I would guess some white people would hear that and say, oh, okay. Um, yeah, maybe there's some isolated instances where some people are ignorant and act poorly, but but, but so, you're talking about something bigger. So, so, so there was a recent issue of where a Christian woman refused to provide service to a couple that was um, interracial, a mm. black person and a white person. Mm. And she did that based upon some biblical standing. I mean, and, and there was the Bible doesn't teach that, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> if you're tracking anything. Yeah. And, 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 re and what happened was, um, there was this, well, of course, you know, the internet, ah, Twitter, everybody, they were just went, there's nothing in the Bible about that. So she had to repent of that. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is what I have been taught. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is recent within the last year or two. So Good there example. are still things mm -hmm. that are going on. Um, yeah, that's good. Helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. When I go to a, sorry, shout out here. This is Josh behind the camera. <laughs> Podcast Josh. <laughs> when I go to a store, Target, Walmart, Giant Eagle, with David Bowens, I have a different experience than when I go by myself. Hmm. Of who sees me, how frequently the clerks look at us while we're shopping, and uh, that happens to me. Does that happen to you? Uh, well, you she's know, always black. So. <laughs> in, in some case, maybe, but you know, sometimes I just, I don't, I'm not aware of it, maybe. I'm just not aware of it because I'm so singularly focused, like, okay, I got to get this, and so I don't think of it. It has happened to me when I've gone to buy a car. Okay. I have gone in to buy a car, and sales people will just be dismissive like okay she is not coming in here to buy a car she's just looking and when I've really been looking and it's been really hard for me to do to you know get so, a sales so they person. assume because you you assume they assume because you were black that you didn't have enough so money to buy the there's the two car. things mm -hmm. it black and then I wasn't dressed up I was like going in looking like okay then mm -hmm. I'm well, just why going do in you here feel like you need to do that? because white people I've always and this is what I was taught from my parents. It's like you always got to look better. You always got to know more just to get just to get a little bit. Yeah. So and that's really the thing, because the one thing that my parents always said is get an education. They white people can't take it away from you. And so that is the one thing. It's like, it's really, and this is, in the black community for the most part, black parents really do, uh, it's especially my generation, and I'm going to be clear about my generation, is like you have to get an education because we want you to have more than we have, and mm -hmm. that is something that they cannot take. Wow. So a bunch of white people that are listening, watching, um, what would you say to the white community about how, uh, we can do a better job of uh, 
helping you not feel like the odd person out when you walk into a room. So I think it, it, the one thing is racism is really sin at the foundation of everything. Yeah. So I think that if as Christians, if you see me walking in the room, just like everyone else, embrace me. Talk to me like you would anyone else, because sometimes I struggle with it. Is it because I'm black or is it because they don't know me? Because, I mean, I have lived in a community that was much more demonstrative around love and encouragement. And in white communities, they are less so. Okay. So sometimes I have to balance that, like, okay, is it because I'm black or is it because uh, they just don't know who I am? Sometimes I choose to think it's because I'm black. Mm. Um, so I think it's just, uh, as Christians, just being more open, just embracing people. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think um, part of what we need to do is is change, change the issue in our minds so that it's not um, – it's not uh, necessarily a racism, but it's a it's a racial insensitivity that we need to be uh, aware of. Because you know anybody listening is going to say, "No, I'm not a racist person." Um, sure, fine. You know we can we can agree to that. But um, but we have these racial insensitivities where we just say things or we assume things, and you're not doing it on purpose. You're not doing it to be mean. But that's where we need to sort of go below the surface to change the way that we're thinking. Um, well, that's, I hear you, and I think you're absolutely right. But here are some things, and I, I don't know if we soften the words that it's still not racism. Yeah. Um, yeah. As an example, I get in an elevator, not me, because you know, people aren't really afraid of me. Sometimes <laughs> they should be. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'll, it's like my brother or my you know, cousins or someone male will get in an elevator, and if white women, even men get in there, it's like, oh, my, you can see the fear on mm-hmm. their eyes. It's like, mm-hmm. oh. And this person is a Christian. And they're like, oh, my goodness, I'm getting in this elevator with these people. And... Um, they don't know that I'm thinking the same thing. If I'm in an elevator and I'm alone, especially if it's black people that get on, I'm never afraid. But if it's white people that get on and it's just me, hmm. I'm like, I'm not getting on that elevator. I'm waiting until they go wherever they're going. Yeah. So it is uh, the same kind of thing with black people. Yeah. Uh, it's like. So, so let me ask a question with that sure. analogy, because this and this is this may feel like an insensitive question. I don't mean it to be. Um you just cited that as an example of current racism. Somebody saying, I don't want to get on an elevator with black people. And then you said, I don't want to get on an elevator with white people. How is that not racist the other way? I think that I am just being, I am protecting myself. Okay. And in some ways, as a woman, I'm Mm -hmm. protecting myself. In some ways, I don't think that... Again, in this so, may so, be but, so, so, so my question is, if a white woman says the same thing, but you're assuming that that's racist. Mm-hmm. And I think because of the history of, for example, example Emmett Till. Mm-hmm. Emmett Till was um, hung because he, uh, some white woman said that he, that, um, he looked at her when, mm-hmm. in fact, he didn't, and he was murdered because of that. Mm-hmm. So I think there's this whole historical perspective for white people that... That black, justice will be on their side. Right, exactly. The okay, okay. Anything else that we want to... Do you have any other thoughts or wrapping up uh, our time here? I love, <laughs> I love you. I love you. I got a lot of love thoughts. You. <laughs> I think that um, these sorts of conversations are some of the most helpful and we have to have the conversations and, uh, and just to be able to understand yeah. each other better and uh, yeah. And to do so in a charitable way is yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank one, you. one, uh, one rapid fire question. How Uh-oh. about that? Uh, here we go. Um, if you could snap your fingers and instantly become a pro at something, what would it be? 
Kurt. Oh, that's easy. Basketball player. <laughs> uh, I mean, my goodness. Yes. Could be paid to play basketball, turn the clock back to my early 20s, have a sick jumper, great athleticism. Absolutely. <laughs> Joanne? I think I would be a pro cake maker. Keg? Cake. Cake. <laughs> yeah, see there, your mind went to the beer. <laughs> cake. Cake maker. Yeah. I would... Uh, I had some time to think about this, so it's no fair. I would uh, be a pro uh, real estate investor if I could do that on the side. That's all I got. So. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for checking out the Ask a Pastor podcast uh, where we like to jump into topics that are sometimes uncomfortable and, um, and in this case show that we can have good, meaningful conversations about uh, topics that are difficult and uh, and try to understand them a little bit better. So please send in questions, ask a pastor at orchardhillchurch.com. We'd love to uh, be able to answer those in future podcasts. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.